Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Godfrey and I'm based at the University of Otago in Dunedin, New Zealand, which in case you're wondering where that is, it's in this little corner of the world where it's currently 5.30am on Friday, but I have been up since 2am listening to all the great talks so far and I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to participate in this virtual symposium. Today I want to give a very brief overview of a book chapter I've been working on with my co-author Robert Poulan, looking at the manipulation of host behaviour by parasites and the consequences that has for other aspects of animal behaviour. Parasite manipulation has to be one of the most captivating aspects of the host-parasite interaction, where we can get these really elaborate changes in host morphology, behaviour and phenotype, which are thought to increase the chances of that parasite making it from its current host to the next host in its life cycle, often through predation. Parasite manipulation of host behaviour is most common in parasites with complex life cycles and the behavioural modi modifications can vary from the very elaborate as we see here on this slide through to quite subtle changes in activity patterns or responses to environmental cues. And what I'd like to talk about today is what are the consequences of these behavioural modifications for animal behaviour. So one of the topics of animal behaviour that I'd like to focus on is animal personality and behavioural syndromes. And the reason for that is that quite often the behavioural targets of parasite manipulation are the same behaviours that we'd probably measure in an animal personality study. And so an example here is the fathead minnow, where the authors have found a relationship between the number of parasites per fish on the x-axis here, and a boldness measure, which is the latency to emerge on the y-axis. So we have bolder fish down the bottom, which are quicker to emerge, and shyer fish up the top, which are slower to emerge. And what we see is that fish that are really heavily infected with these parasites also tend to be bolder. And so these are our riskier fish. And being a riskier fish probably puts you at greater risk of predation, which is going to enable that parasite to get to the next, life, next host in its life cycle, which is a bird. And so we can see how these behaviours that we would normally measure as personality traits are certainly advantageous to parasites um, in, in enabling them to complete their life cycle. But it's not just the mean behaviour that we're interested in. Um, by definition, animal personality requires a behaviour to be expressed consistently by an individual. And so parasites can, can alter how consistently these behaviours are expressed. Another example is an eye fluke in the European minnow. So these eye flukes live in the eyeball and probably obscure the sight of the fish and, and how it perceives its environment. And the authors of this study experimentally infected minnows with fish and found that experimental infection didn't actually change the boldness activity or exploration of these fish, but it affected how repeatedly those behaviours were expressed. So on the y-axis here, we have the intra-class correlation coefficient, which is a measure of how repeatable the behaviour is. And the authors found that in fish that were infected with either a high or a low dose of parasites had more repeatable boldness and activity behaviours than the control fish. On the other hand, for exploration behaviour, the control fish show repeatable behaviours for this behavioural trait but the experimentally infected fish did not. And so this suggests that parasites are able to not only affect how bold or shy a fish might be, but also how repeatable uh, behaviour is and thereby how much of a personality trait it is. And I guess the next sort of logical link to make to this is that if parasites can manipulate some behaviours but not others, this could actually decouple behavioural syndromes, which are sort of co-evolved sets of behaviours. So if we look back to our fathead minnows, the authors did find a behavioural syndrome where boldness on the x-axis here, our latency to emerge, was correlated with activity. So we find that bolder fish tend to be more active and shy fish tend to be less active. And so these Behavioural correlations have probably evolved due to fitness benefits of being either one thing or the other. But if parasites are able to change one of these behaviours, say activity, but not boldness, we might start to see a shift in these behavioural profiles from this sort of pre-adapted 
uh, correlation between boldness and activity to shy fish all of a sudden becoming more active and perhaps becoming more vulnerable to predation as a result. So these decoupling of behavioural syndromes could lead to higher predation, but this is currently an area of research that needs a lot more work to investigate how this might happen. Another aspect of behaviour I'd like to touch on is social and collective behaviours. Parasites can alter the aggregative behaviours of hosts, either increasing ag aggregation or reducing aggregation. And in the three spine stickleback, um, these researchers have found that infection with a microsporidium parasite can actually increase attraction to conspecifics. So these microsporidians form these little tumours on the surface of the fish, which when they're disrupted, they burst open and spores uh, are released from the fish. And so infected fish have been found to approach conspecifics more quickly and spend more time with them than uninfected fish. And so that might actually aid the transmission of this parasite, which is going to be increased due to proximity between conspecifics. So it's one thing to alter how attracted you are to conspecifics, but in, in societies where there's pre-existing social preferences and affiliations, parasites might also change those preferences. And so there's been a lot of research on the social networks of sticklebacks and they've found that they do have stable social networks. So if parasites are able to alter some of these social preferences, they could actually have quite big impacts on the social network structure. So a different fish again, this is an eye fluke that we're looking at this time. The authors were interested in how the eye fluke might influence shoaling preferences. And so they found that uninfected fish showed a stronger preference for mixed shoals. So those are shoals with both infected and uninfected fish in them. Whereas our infected fish showed no strong preference. So they weren't very fussy in who they, which fish they shoaled with. And so if eye flukes make fish less fussy about who they're interacting with, potentially it could have the um, ability to disrupt some of these existing social affiliations within a population. And then finally, touching back to personality, the personality of an individual often has quite a strong link to where they sit in their social network. So if parasites can alter personality traits, they could also be indirectly altering where individuals sit in their social networks. So in the three spines stickleback, infected with a different parasite, again, a cestode, it's been found that this cestode, when it's experimentally infected in fish, can lead to much lower uh, latencies to return to food after a bird strikes, a much more bold and more consistently bold fish than either of the control groups. And so if these parasites are making these fish more bold, that could have consequences for where they sit in their social networks. And certainly other researchers found that bolder fish have more homogenous associations in their social networks and fish prefer shoaling with other bold fish. And so if we just take a look at how this might work in a, in a fictional social, social network of sticklebacks, we might have a fish that's infected with microsporidia and it's more attracted to conspecifics. So we add a few links in our social network. We've got eye flukes, which mean that the host becomes less fussy about who they're interacting with. So they might change some of their interactions. And finally, we have a fish that's infected with cestodes, so it becomes more bold and other fish are preferring to show with it, so we add in more connections. And so we can see by just adding three different parasites to our social network, we end up with quite a differently shaped network to what we started with. And so potentially these parasites could substantially alter the social network structure of these fish populations. And that's gonna have consequences for other processes that happen on these networks. So the transmission of information or other infections. And these networks are not static, they're dynamic. And so as a fish becomes infected, it might be changing its behavior, changing its interaction patterns, and that's altering its vulnerability to subsequent infection, either by that or another parasite. And so we can start to get these feedback loops develop between network position and infection. And so I'd just like to wrap up by highlighting that I think parasite manipulation is potentially a hidden influence in behavioural ecology. 
when we think about parasite manipulation, we think of these really dramatic and elaborate changes in morphology and behaviour, but I actually think it's the more subtle impacts that might have more pervasive in effects on some of these concepts in animal behaviour that we're looking at here. And I think, you know, we're only just at the very start of starting to understand these, and there's certainly a lot of scope to do more research to looking at the impacts that parasite manipulation has on personality, behavioural syndromes and animal social networks. So I'd like to thank you for listening and welcome any questions during the Q&A.